Okay, uh, thank you Alexa and thank you everyone for coming out to my talk this afternoon. I'm super excited to be giving this. This is actually my first talk, so bear with me. Um, everyone did a really good job about bringing the framework for this whole talk together. Um, I'm sure you're going to hear a few things that everyone has said so far, but I'm sure you just want to hear it again. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about the feasibility of restoring Lake Whitefish as an integral component of the Coldwater Fish Community of Otsego Lake. Uh, this is a collaborative study between SUNY Oneana Biological Field Station, SUNY Cobalt Scale, and as well as the New York State uh, DEC. So here we go, the Lake Whitefish. The first record of the Lake Whitefish was found in DK's Zoology of New York book in 1842. Um, at this point, they were actually calling this fish uh, Corrigonus Otsego, but then later on, biologists realized that they were dealing with the Lake Whitefish, so Corrigonus Puthiformis. They were extremely abundant at one point um, in the lake, and they actually supported a commercial fishery as well as a sport fishery. So this created jobs for people in local communities. It was a good recreational sport for people around here. Um, and their distribution, they're mostly found in Canada as well as Alaska, and then move into some northern states um, into lakes like in New York and Minnesota. Uh, we can find them here in New York in Otsego, uh, Saranac, Champlain, um, and we are in their most southern end, or right, the most southern part of their range here in Otsego. They're not found in any lakes that are uh, really south of here. And their population has pretty much been on the decline um, for the last few years, and this is how that pro this project has come about. So, important life history features. Um, right here, you can see a nice photo, um, courtesy of Mark Romo, uh, comparing a cisco and a lake whitefish. So we have the cisco on the top and the lake whitefish on the bottom. Some important key features of the lake whitefish are that they have a rounded snout and that their mouths are subterminal, and then compared to the cisco, who have a terminal mouth and a pointed snout. Um, these fish like to spawn in between October and December, and we find that they move into areas in the lake when, it, or spawning areas in the lake, when the re lake reaches about eight degrees uh, centigrade. So the males come in first, and then the females follow right behind. They like to spawn in waters less than five meters deep with a cobble gravel bottom. Um, so eggs and fry. A spawning female, if she weighs about 4.5 pounds, she's gonna produce about 45,000 eggs. So it's 10,000 eggs per one pound of female. Um, these eggs take 120 to 140 degree days to hatch within the lake. And once they do hatch, these fish start feeding on microcrustaceans with only, within only two weeks uh, post hatch. Once they reach 25 millimeters, these fish, actually their mouths begin to turn down and they go to the bottom in 60 feet of water and start feeding off the bottom. And they are slow growing fish. It's been shown that fish can take up to 16 years to grow to full size, but we have not found any fish that will live not go with any of our aging data. Again, I, saw, I know you saw this photo, but um, I just wanted to show the body comparisons here. So again, top is Cisco and the bottom is Lake Whitefish. Um, they are much deeper bodies than the Cisco. These are a little more streamlined, not as deep. And then Lake Whitefish have a little bit of a hump on the back of their head, I guess it would be. So what has happened? I know we have talked about this numerous times today. Um, so we had that alewife introduction in the 1980s. Um, this caused the Lake Whitefish, what we think, caused the Lake Whitefish populations to decline. Um, the alewife hang out in the pelagic area in the lake, as do the Lake Whitefish fry. So we think there's a direct correlation between the alewife predating on the lake whitefish fry, as well as a direct competition for food between alewife and the whitefish. Um, so obviously we've heard this story from Mark numerous times. We also mention it all the time. But back in 2000, we uh, stocked some walleye in the lake, and it was supposed to extirpate the population or decline the population of uh, alewife in the lake. So. Alewife are opportunistic feeders. Um, they hang out pelagic areas, epilimnion, um, and feed on the same things as these whitefish, as I said earlier. So after the walleye were stocked, it took a while, but there was a peak of alewife in 2002, and then we found the crash or extirpated them in 2011. So this actually worked out really well. And so now that the alewife have crashed, we're thinking to, we're trying to bring back the whitefish population. So when we were coming up with this study, it was about 2015 when we started this study. Um, like I said earlier, we collaborated with New York State DEC, Biological Field Station, as well as SUNY Cobal Scale, and two objectives came to mind when we started this study. Um, we wanted to document Lake Whitefish spawning locations and supplement the populations through field spawning, egg rearing, and then the stocking of the fries and fingerlings. 
So our study sites, just right outside here. Um, this is at Seagull Lake. You guys have seen this picture before. Um, the way we did this, we had fry immersion traps, uh, electrofishing boats, and Oneidastat trap nets. Um, with the fry immersion traps, they were actually used to look at larval lake whitefish, um, I mean, <laughs> larval lake trout in the lake in spawning shoals between three and five mile point. And when the students were actually looking at these lake trout fry, they were seeing that there's lake whitefish there, so this is how that study kind of came about. Um, the, when we were field, or when we were out gathering information in the field, we took length measurements, um, weight, sex, ripeness of the whitefish, and we also took scales for aging. So, and those were taken from below the lateral line behind the left pectoral fin. So the age and size of our spawners. In 2015, we caught 18 ripe whitefish. Um, and these fish were seen to be between three and six years old, about 500 to 630 millimeters, and 1.7 to 2.9 kilograms. But then unfortunately in 2016, we didn't catch any ripe whitefish that we used for any of our spawning. Um, but recently in December of 2017, just a few months ago, we collected 35 ripe whitefish. It's a little bit higher than our first year, that's good. Um, 36 years old, 500 to 640 millimeters, and about 1.3 to uh, 2.9 kilograms. So spawning locations. Uh, whitefish are known to spawn at least four locations in Otsego Lake. We have Clark Point, Thistle Point, Sunken Island, and then recently, uh, which we found out from this year, this big star right here is between three and five mile point, and this is where we caught all of our whitefish for this year's uh, spawning. So back in 2015, we spawned three females, I believe to 10 males. Um, we got 71,000 eggs for incubation. And then in 2017, we spawned three females and I believe 12 males for 101,000 eggs um, for incubation. So lake whitefish egg take. Um, when we were out electrofishing or trap netting or anything, males and three females were both separated um, in coolers. They were anesthetized with carbon dioxide. Females were spawned into this mesh screen basket right here. Um, and then they were transferred to a spawning bowl, which you can see on this side. Males were then directly spawned into that bowl and eggs and milk were set aside for about two minutes to do dry spawning. And then after a few minutes after that, we added cool pathogen-free water to the, um, to the eggs and milk and let that sit. Then after that, we rinsed them off, got them going, um, put them in a 50 ppm solution of iodine so we can control, according to US Fish and Wildlife protocols, um, and this will kill any pathogens so we didn't bring anything from the lake back to our quarantine hatchery at Sydney Cold Scale. Um, after that, they were rinsed off, placed in incubator water, and transferred back to Cold Scale where they would live. Our hatchery studies. So the incubation. Um, these eggs were placed in McDonald jars. We had three separate jars um, in an insert tank, which you can see right here. Um, and the temperature was kept at 8.6 degrees Celsius. It took about 300 to 350 degree days for these fish to um, hatch in our hatchery settings. And we kept normal conditions in the room, so we can control the light, we control the temperature, the humidity, all that good stuff to make these guys grow. Um, as you can see, these are our fertilization, IOP, and hatch rates. So in 2016, 80% um, of our eggs had been fertilized, 60% had eyed up, and then about 35% had hatched. And then this year, um, we had a 75% fertilization rate, uh, eggs eyed up about 55%, and we're expecting between a 30 and 40% uh, percent for hatch. Um, just some really cool pictures we got going on here. Um, to your left, you can see this is one week. Uh, this is all the developmental stages that I've seen looking at the lake whitefish eggs. Um, here we have one week post eye up. This is two weeks post eye up, and so these fish, you, get, you start to see the different organism or the organs forming in their body. Their hearts are pumping blood through, you can see their eyes better. And then right in the middle is uh, just a few days before hatch. So obviously these guys had to eat. Um, <clears throat> so these fish were fed a live diet of rotifers and brine shrimp. They also were fed uh, otaheme fry diet, wild live plankton, uh, grindle worms, vinegar eels, all that kind of stuff. And we wanted to replicate natural, natural conditions here because once we stock these fish out, sometimes hatchery fish get like uh, are attracted to pellets or stuff like that. And we wanted to have the live feed in there for them to chase around and understand so when they get in the wild that they'll actually survive. 
Um, and food was constantly and readily available for these fish. We had a belt feeder that had Ziegler trout diet on it um, that was running 24 hours a day. We had a 16 hour feeding cycle of live rotifers. And then we also put in uh, vinegar eels and grindle worms morning and evening. So we have a cool graph here that was made by John Foster. Um, so when these fry hatch and fall in or swim into the insert tank, they weigh about 0 0.018 grams, which is extremely tiny. Um, and from this graph, you can see that fish grew relatively slowly for the first 150 days post hatch. But then you see this drastic incline right here. Um, and fish were growing about 0.6 millimeters a day, which is it's huge. And we found that fish reached about one gram at 100 days for spring stocking. And then fish also reached um, 25 grams for fall stocking at about 200 days. Sort of like whitefish survival. So we had only about 35% survival in this study. Um, that's pretty low compared to some other studies that we have read. Um, our incubator room, we've actually had a little bit of higher temperatures. We kept our eggs at about 8.6, but reading some studies, it says 95% survival can actually occur at 2.5 degrees Celsius. Um, and then if you keep that between the two and three degrees Celsius mark, you're gonna produce larger sac fry hatch. Um, and we also had a catastrophic outbreak of bacterial gill disease, which we lost a lot of our fish at that point. Um, we treated them with hydrogen peroxide and uh, Ziegler medicated food. But what now? So what is the current status of Lake Whitefish at SUNY Global Scale? Like I said, we recently just spawned 101,000 eggs. Uh, they are currently rolling in our McDonald jars and are hatching pretty much right now. Um, so we do have 25 juvenile whitefish from our 25 or 2015, 2016 study. Um, they're going to be tagged with pit tagged and with pit tags and put into the lake probably right after ice out um, in the spring of 2018. We do have two students that are going to be continuing this project. Uh, one's going to be looking at the marking and tagging of Lake Whitefish for stocking in Otsego Lake, and the other is going to be looking at the larval recruitment of Lake Whitefish in Otsego. So will this work? Um, we've actually found that collecting these fish and spawning them is relatively easy. Yeah, they're a little hard to keep alive, but we think it's a feasible approach to restoring Lake Whitefish in Otsego Lake. Uh, change is good, so we changed a few things in our quarantine hatchery, our water distribution, we have a better cold water source this time, um, room capacity, we move things around. Um, the stocking benefits, so this is shown, it's probably going to jumpstart or hopefully jumpstart the uh, cold water ecology of Otsego Lake. And conservation aquaculture seems to be a feasible approach to raise these lake whitefish and um, sustain the populations, hopefully, for future generations. Um, none of this could be done with any, without any of these partners up here, as well as my partners in crime on the top. Uh, Kevin Thomas, Caroline Schaefer, and Dan Garrett have all taken over the project or worked with me on the project. Uh, Student Global Scale Fisheries and Aquaculture staff, students, faculty, New York State DEC Region 4 Fisheries, SUNY Oneana's Biological Field Station, uh, Pete and Jim at the Oneana, Ontario, yes, Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry, and then a research grant that was awarded to myself from the Skagheri County Conservation Association. So with that, I'd be happy to take any questions.